really excited to introduce you to our speaker, um, Kim Adelson. She's an active member of Black Hills Audubon as well as the Washington Native Plant Society. And she has given um, presentations to Philip Judge Audubon before and they've been fantastic. So I'm really excited to have her with us today and I will go ahead and hand it over to you, Kim. Okay, thank you. Um, is everybody seeing my, my slides rather than me? Yes. Okay, so that's all working. Okay, good. Um, first off, I just wanted to say uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to do this. There are a few things I like doing more than talking about uh, creating bird-friendly yards. Um, I think it's really important. I think you can make a beautiful, beautiful yard doing it. You can attract tons of birds. Um, I live down in Olympia. I have about an acre and I've counted 52 different species of birds in my yard. So the message I wanna give you is yes, you can do it. There are lots of birds around here to attract, not only good numbers, but lots of different species. Um, and so, you know, I, ho I hope to inspire you uh, to do things that, that will not only beautify your yard in my opinion, but make it good viable habitat uh, for birds. And um, in order to inspire you, before I start talking about the nuts and bolts, which is what most of the talk is going to be, I mean, actually, how do you do it? What do you put into your yard? Um, I want to tell you why it's so important um, to make your yard a bird haven. Um, and, and basically, the long and the short of it is, is that birds are in trouble. Um, David Yarnalls, who's president of the National Audubon Society, uh, a couple of years ago, said nearly half of our birds are at risk for extinction this century and that that doesn't have to happen. Well, the bad news is, as he said this about three years ago, now if he said it, he would say two thirds. The best estimates now are that two thirds um, of our birds are at risk for extinction. So um, birds are in trouble. Um, and it's not just a prediction. It's not something, I mean, we, we are predicting it into the future, but it's already happening. And so it's, it's not kind of a pie in the sky prediction. Right now, there are 30% fewer individual birds in the United States than there were in the 1970s. That's from Cornell University. So we've already lost a third of our birds um, and we're poised to risk more. And so anything any of us or all of us can do uh, to stem that tide is a good thing. Why are we losing birds? Oh, I also wanted to say that all of the pictures uh, of birds, for those of you who aren't, uh, aren't familiar with a lot of native birds, are all birds native to this area. Uh, and most of them, not all of them are yard birds. So um, you can be inspired that way too. But anyway, why are we losing so many birds? Um, right now, I would say the most important reason is climate change. Um, and I give talks on that, I bet I could go on for that forever. Um, habitat loss has been going on for a long time and continues every time you take a patch of forest and, you know, and, and cut it down and put in a housing development, there, there's fewer places for birds to live. Um, insect reduction. For many, many years, we've used lots and lots of pesticides. We've drained swamps, things like that. There are far fewer insects now um, than there used to be. I notice that all the time myself because I'm old enough to remember that when I used to drive in the country, my windshield would just get covered with bugs and that doesn't happen anymore. Um, I'm not, not cleaning my windshield every night like I used to. And Almost all birds, not all, but almost all birds, even those that you think of as being seed eaters, in breeding season rely heavily on insects for their diet. So if there aren't insects for them to eat, um, then they're, they're not going to be able to breed. We also have a problem with forage fish decline. That's not so much for yard birds, um, but, but still contributing to it. And then finally, last but not least, um, domestic cats. Um, are major killers of birds. So that's why we have lost and are continuing to lose so many birds. If we go on just for another minute or two about this, how does climate change affect birds? Um, it's easy to say, but, but exactly what's going on? First off, um, because of climate change, birds migration has become off time. Um, historically, bird migration is timed uh, around two things. First off, you, you, you don't want to get hit. You don't want to go someplace. You don't want to you don't want to fly north and then there's a storm. You know, uh, you want to you want to beat the worst of the weather or 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 uh, get there after the worst of the weather has passed. But also most birds time their migration to peak insect volume. Again, during breeding season, birds uh, live heavily on insects. And so since insects 
the time that insects hatch is so closely tied to temperature as the world gets warmer, insects are um, hatching earlier and earlier in the year. The birds have moved up their migration, but not as much as the insects. And so they go and there's not as much food for them. So that's, that's one issue. Um, second issue is that just in, uh, in general with climate change, uh, certain plant species are dying off uh, and the insects that rely on them are dying off. So, so some plants and insects are, are scarcer than they used to be. Um, climate change drives habitat change. A really clear example of that is wetlands become more brackish, they become more salty with sea level rise. And so the plant and insect species turn over. We've all experienced this, but summer droughts, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, are getting longer and more severe than they've historically been. Um, and, and that affects uh, plant and insect life, which affects birds. They also lead to forest fires and more devastating forest fires because everything is just a tinderbox. And again, um, you're gonna find fewer shellfish and forage fish because the oceans become more acidic. You know, when you put carbon which turns into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it falls as actually very slightly acidic rain. Uh, and you're creating carbonic acid. That's the kind of acid there is in soda pop. Um, and that's really bad for shellfish, um, whose shells are essentially made of chalk and dissolve away. So um, birds are in trouble. And again, I'm trying to inspire you to really want to um, you know, do what you can to, to give them a nice place to live. Well, Again, before we get to the mechanics, I mean, why should you care whether there are birds around? Isn't that a nice picture of a kinglet? Um, and, and, and basically the, the, the short answer is, I mean, there are crazy people like me who just like to go out and watch birds all the time, but, but forgetting people like me, um, the short answer is that plants and other animals need birds. And if bird populations dwindle, then again, the whole ecosystem um, is in trouble. So what do birds do uh, for the rest of the ecosystem? plants in particular. Um, first off, they're, they're pollinators. Uh, about 7,000 species of plants globally are either exclusively or almost exclusively pollinated by birds. Again, if there are no birds, then those plants are in trouble. Now to be fair, most of those species are in the tropics, not, not, not in our latitude. But even so, a lot of the plants that birds pollinate are important to people. Bananas, mangoes, nutmeg. Um, there are lots of, of things that we like to eat that rely on birds. And in our region, plants like orange honeysuckle, manzanita, flowering currants, salmonberry, huckleberry, native rhodes, twinberry, I could go on, uh, monarda, uh, sitka columbine, Pacific bleeding heart, those are all birds that are uh, plants that are pollinated by birds. And so we need birds for that reason. That's one thing birds do for plants. Another thing birds do for plants is they disperse seeds. Um, and this is really, really important in our region. 85% of our wetland plant, our wetland plants rely upon birds to disperse their seeds. And this is something that birds really excel at because they travel such long distances. So if a duck eats a grass seed and flies, sometimes it drops that seed 80 to 100 miles away. Wind can't do that, insects can't do that, mammals can't do that. Um, that's really a purview of birds. Um, and Bird, pollen, uh, bird seed dispersal is so important for plants that many plants have evolved seeds that, will that are only able to germinate if in fact they've been eaten by a bird. So what plants do um, is they create seeds that have very, very hard husks, very thick, hard shells. And if those seeds just fall to the ground, they can't germinate. They have to pass through a bird's gut with its digestive acids to wear away some of that husk before they can, uh, they can grow. In fact, that, the reason fruits and nuts evolved really is so that birds um, will pollinate. Um, so anyway, anyway, very, very important here. Third thing birds do for plants is they eat plant predators. Um, and uh, Birds can reduce 
the number of insects on a tree by 90%, by up to 90%. Um, and so one way to control excess insects is to have a healthy bird population. Um, this is very important commercially, actually, because uh, apple orchards, pear orchards, for example, studies have shown that if you don't have a lot of birds around. I mean, the way they do these studies is they take an orchard and they take half of it and they cover it with netting that insects can get through, but birds can't. So you can compare the productivity of the trees where there were birds getting to them with trees where there were no birds. And you find that the uh, crop yields are much, much, much larger if the birds were there uh, to kill off the insects. Yes, the birds damage a little bit of the fruit, but they protect far more of the fruit then they hurt. Um, oh, I forgot I had this slide in here. Um, this is my favorite example of how important birds are in, in terms of, of, of cutting inf uh, insect infestation. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember back to the 1960s, but in the 1960s, there was what was called the Great Famine in China and more than 30 million people died in the early 60s in China um, because of starvation. And the reason that happened, the main reason that happened is Mao Zedong in 1958 declared a war against sparrows. He actually declared war against the four pests. Um, the other pests always made sense to me, flies, mosquitoes, rats, and sparrows were his four pests. And the reason he declared war against sparrows is he thought they were eating too much grain. Um, and so he ordered the people in China, and of course he was you know, a, a dictator who people would do what he said, to kill all the sparrows they found. And they essentially drove sparrows to extinction, to near extinction in China, um, 1959, 1960. Well, what happened once that happened is the very following year, the locust and grasshopper population began to explode and Within two years, it had just become unbelievable. And that's what led to the famine. They were eating all the grain. Um, so they, uh, birds are important because they eat plant predators. They and their eggs are food for other animals. And lastly, let's not forget, they are just beautiful. If you don't recognize that, that's a northern flicker, uh, which is a yard bird, very common yard bird. Okay, so that's why, I hope I have inspired you. That's why it's important. Uh, to make bird-friendly yards. And again, there are lots and lots and lots of birds in this area. There are lots of species in this area. No one's gonna see everything because it depends upon um, what you've got planted, whether or not you've got snags. We'll talk more about snags, what kind of food's available, what kind of water is available and what habitat you're in. I mean, if you're sitting in the middle of a, a, a fields, you're gonna get very different birds than if you're sitting in the middle of the, the woods or if you you live right on water. So, but there are lots and lots and lots of birds. Okay, so how do you do it? How do you make your garden bird friendly? Right. Well, there are six overall strategies, okay? Six overall strategies. Uh, there are three things you need to protect birds from. And then there are three things you need to provide them. So we need to, and I'll go through all of these one by one, but you need to protect birds from predators. You need to protect them from window strikes and you need to protect them from toxins. And then you need to make sure that you have and are providing food and water and shelter. And so now we can go through these pretty much one by one and talk about how do you do this. But, but overall, I wanna say this uh, before I get going even with that, that these are the strict, the six overarching strategies, but there's one intervention that does four of them, four out of the six, all by itself, and that is to plant native plants. If there's one take-home message, I mean, there's actually like two take-home messages I want to give you, but one of the two is if you don't remember anything else, remember to plant native plants. That's, that, that's really key because native plants provide them with food, provide them with shelter. Uh, you don't usually need to use pesticides when you're uh, in herbicides if you're um, planting natives and protection from predators. There's a nice hawthorn uh, with its thorns that are keeping the, the doves safe. So planting native plants is just a super way to go if you wanna help birds. Okay, the other reason to plant native plants 
I'm going to keep talking about native plants, is that native plants entice the insects that our birds need to feed their young. So that's good. You want some insects in your yard. Again, if you have insects and you've got birds, you won't have an insect problem. Native plants reduce the need to water because they're adapted to our area and certainly reduce the need to mow. Uh, you know, native ground covers don't need to be mowed the way lawn does. So there are lots of good reasons to go for natives. Okay, now let's go through those six strategies one by one. Um, so how do you help birds avoid predators? There you go. I thought that was going to come right up. Um, and I'm going to mostly focus, well, I'm going to really entirely focus on cats. And I say this as a cat owner and a long-term cat owner, so I don't have anything against cats, believe me. But cats are the single biggest predator um, for birds. The average cat in America, and that includes those that are, you know, indoor cats only and live in cities, but if you took the, the cat population in the United States, um, the average cat in America kills nine birds per year. Um, so, so you know that obviously birds that are outdoors are, are killing a lot more than that. Um, estimates are that, depends on who you believe, between 50 and 80 percent um, of cats that are outdoors do take birds. Um, and they kill more than three billion birds a year in the United States. I mean, that's a, this is a, a really a, a major, major problem. Um, in fact, around the world, 33 species of birds have been driven to extinction solely by cats. Uh, we know it's by cats. Let me give you an example of that because I used to live in New Zealand. It was my midlife crisis. Um, moved to New Zealand for a few years. In New Zealand, which has a lot of small islands besides the two big islands, there was an, there's an island called Chatham Island. And Chatham Island used to be the home of the Chatham Island wren which was actually the smallest songbird in the world. It was no bigger than a hummingbird. Um, not really a wren, though that's, that, that's its name. Anyway, we know that cats killed off, to, drove to extinction Chatham Island wrens. And the reason we know this is uh, the wrens have been living there, you know, for God knows how many thousands of years, tens and tens and thousands of years. And then they decided to build a lighthouse on the island and they built an, a lighthouse and the light, the guy who came to be the lighthouse keeper brought his pregnant cat with him. Within two years, there were no more Chatham Island wrens. I mean, there's just no doubt what happened. And so, I mean, cats really are very, very serious predators um, of birds. Um, I get asked questions about cats all the time. Um, some people say, well, my cat is declawed. So does that mean it can't get birds? The answer is no, declawed cats get birds very, very, very easily. Um, I put a bell on my cat. Uh, will that keep birds safe? No, bells don't mean anything to birds. Um, and by the time they learn that a bell means it's a cat, they're dead. Um, and so belling a cat doesn't do any good. Um, the birds that are most vulnerable to cats are ground nesters, uh, ground feeders, and young birds who are clumsy and, and, and less wary than, than older. Um, so anyway, cats are really, really big problems. So what do you do? I mean, there's a bunch of things you can do. One thing is, um, is you can keep your cat indoors. Um, and if you get a new cat, especially, I strongly urge you to do this. It's not only good for birds, it's good for your cat. Veterinarians prefer that cats live indoors. They probabilistically will live longer, healthier lives um, if you keep them indoors. Uh, so uh, you know, that's certainly not bad for your cat. Um, if you've got a cat who, and some, some cats take to it very well, even if they've been outdoors, some cats do not. Um, but then there are other things you can do. For example, crazy cat lady here, um, you can walk them. Some cats like this, some cats don't. I once had a cat who loved to go for walks with me. I don't anymore. My cat wouldn't stand this. So this is what I do for my cat. These are not my cats. But that is my cat yurt, my cat tent. I bought that that very yurt for my cat. And um, this way she gets to go outdoors and it's move. You can stake it down if you're worried, but it's movable. It has a mesh floor. There are lots of different brands of these, but she can feel the grass. She can look all around. She can smell. She loves being out there. 
um, but she can't get to any birds and it would make it much harder for dogs or coyotes to get to her quickly, which is a, an, another plus um, where I live. I worry about that. So this is kind of a, you know, a win-win, but if you want your cat to be outdoors, provide a place for it uh, to do so safely. Now, sometimes um, people say to me, well, it's not my cat, it's my neighbor's cat. So is there anything I can do? And I'm not pushing this brand, but there are a number of products that you can spray around plants that don't smell very bad to people at all. This, this particular one, which uh, I happen to use, um, um, but again, there, there are lots of others, um, smells a little bit like sour apples. Uh, so you can smell it, but it's not an unpleasant smell, but to cats, it's a really unpleasant smell. So if you, um, for example, sprayed it around your feeders or sprayed it wherever this cat's hanging out, um, you can probably get it to, 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 to go elsewhere. Last reason to keep cats indoors. Um, we have huge numbers of feral cats in this country. Um, and, and as this, this graphic shows, um, cats, cats reproduce like rabbits <laughs> or almost like rabbits. I mean, so if you start with a pair of cats um, and, and the female has two litters per year, which is, which is the average and about three survive, in 10 years, this one goes up to nine years, in nine years, you've got now 11 million cats from just those two. I think most people don't realize. Uh, so please spay your cats. Um, not really about birds now so much, but spay your cats so we don't have so many feral cats. Um, and definitely please keep them indoors. Okay, oh, last cat thing. One of the times that birds uh, are particularly vulnerable to cats is when they're feeding. So a good way to, to help um, if there are cats around, if you're worried about this is not to put feeders or bird baths or water sources on the ground. Um, because when they're busy drinking, they're sticking their head down, um, they don't see cats. So elevate them. And as the picture on the right shows, you actually have to elevate them, you know, to some height. I mean, 18 inches isn't going to do it. Okay, so protect them from predators and really the predator to worry about um, is cats. The second thing you can do to help birds uh, and make your garden more friendly. And I get a lot of questions about this too, is to prevent window strikes. Now, people either don't have this problem and they say, I never have a bird hit my window or they say, oh my God, this happens all the time. Um, and so hopefully some of you, since I'm talking about this are in the, oh my God, it happens all the time uh, side of this. Um, estimates are that up to 1 billion birds a year are killed um, by window strikes. So again, this is a, a serious problem. Um, sometimes when I talk to people, they say, well, you know, the real problem, of course, is like apartment buildings and big buildings, but that's not true. More birds are actually killed by hitting homes than by hitting uh, apartment buildings and glass towers. I mean, they, they have their share, but houses are absolutely not, not safe. Um, and even if it doesn't kill them, if they hit the window, sometimes it stuns them or injures them. And if they get stunned or injured, of course, then they're vulnerable to predators um, or can't get to food. Anyway, there are two very different reasons, two very different reasons that birds hit windows um, and, and two different times of day that they hit windows. So let me start off with daytime strikes. Birds that hit your house or your windows in the daytime are probably resonants. Those are not birds passing through. Those are birds that live right around where you live. And basically, as you can see, I mean, the reason birds hit windows often is simply because when they look at the window, they see something appealing. Um, windows can be highly reflective and they're reflecting the outside vegetation and then the birds just see a tree um, or a bush. And so, um, you know, they get that. Uh, sometimes you're not getting a reflection, but you're actually seeing through. So if you've got two windows lined up in your house, you know, and then there's a tree in your backyard, they're just looking right through both windows and seeing the far tree and they think they can, they can go. So anyway, daytime window strikes are usually because of what the bird can see um, in terms of seeing something desirable and they're, they're resonant. 
Here's another example of this, by the way, if you have plants, which most many of us do by our windows, because that's where the light is. Again, they're seeing the plants, and so they're going in. Um, you know, they, they hit the window when they're trying to get to them. Now, the other kind of window strikes, the other reason there are window strikes is very different. And those are night strikes. Some people only have problems at night. Um, night strikes are usually birds that are migrating through. I mean, except for owls and a few others, when birds aren't migrating, they're diurnal. Uh, they're, they're flying around during the day, but at nighttime, or excuse me, during migration, most birds who migrate, migrate at night. And so this is a seasonal problem. You get it in the fall, you get it in the spring. Um, you shouldn't be getting, I mean, it'd be very strange to be getting night strikes um, uh, at other times, you know, during the winter or the summer. Um, and, and the reason you get night strikes during migration is, is kind of like moths being attracted to a candle flame. I mean, part of the way birds navigate is they look for light sources. They look, usually it's the moon, they're looking for the moon. But if they see light in an otherwise dark area, they can be attracted to it. Um, so that's the second kind of strike. And again, it's a different class of birds that you get doing this. So what do you do? What do you do to prevent birds from striking your windows? Well, uh, I'll start with one that's uh, uh, not intuitive, at least not to me, but try moving your bird feeders if you have them closer to your window. People say, oh my God, if they're, if they're on the feeder and then they hit my window, I should move my feeders further away. But if you move your feeders within a couple of feet of your windows, even if the birds were to hit your window, which becomes less likely anyway, but even if they were, they don't hit, they haven't gotten enough speed up yet that they don't hurt themselves. Uh, they just bounce off and they're fine. Um, you know, because they, they haven't gotten to 30 miles an hour yet. So you can try moving feeders closer to your windows if the window you're having trouble with is near a feeder. Another thing you can do is partially close curtains or blinds. Um, so if you've got level oars, for example, you know, twiggle them so that the, the slats are horizontal. You can see out the window, but birds will see a line. Um, that's a really easy thing to do. If you've got a particular window that's giving you trouble, put your plants somewhere else. Um, you know, it, just, just try another window for those and, and likely the birds will not follow. So you can move house plants away from a particularly difficult window. For the night strikes, one thing you can do is use motion detectors on your outside lights. That saves you money too uh, and saves energy. But if, if you don't light up the outside of your house at night all the time, uh, you're minimizing the chances that your house will be attracted. And if you do have outside lights that you want to leave on, point them downwards, not upwards. Okay. Again, that this is less attractive to birds and you're not going to get as many strikes. More sophisticated things you can do is there are, again, lots and lots and lots of companies that make window meshes or decals. Um, I actually, these, these are my decals. <laughs> um, these are the ones that I use. And the reason I like them, and they're, they're really pretty sophisticated things, is they've got this ultraviolet uh, reflective coating. So on the left is pretty much what you see. They're not totally invisible, but they're really very pretty subtle. On the other hand, on the right side is what birds see because they're very sensitive to ultraviolet light. And so they see kind of a bright, purplish glowing thing and they avoid the window. You can get different patterns. You don't have to get hummingbirds. They've, they've got all sorts of different ones. And again, there are different companies, but these are very, very, very effective. But I wanna tell you, you can't just put one on a window. You have to put a couple on a window with what I've found. One doesn't do the trick. Um, oh, by the way, one thing that doesn't work that I see people do all the time is putting plastic owls up you know, thinking that birds will be afraid of the owl and won't come. I have never known that to work, uh, to keep birds off of windows. So uh, I would go for this. So those are the kinds of things you can do. Um, if you have really are key, try some of these and have trouble, Black Hills Audubon has um, a, an email hotline. I can give you the, the, the address at the end uh, that I monitor, which is people who have questions about birds. I'm happy to take questions um, about any of this, but but if you've got a specific question, because this usually really bothers people. Okay, the third thing you do is you prevent poisoning. Okay, you prevent poisoning. And um, 
again, this kills a lot of birds, 67 million birds a year die uh, because they eat something that they shouldn't have. Um, how does poison get into birds? Well, if you spread, for example, a pesticide or an herbicide um, on a plant to, to, to keep bugs away or to, or to feed it, um, the reason that is going to kill the bird is first off, if the bird lands on the bush, lands on the plant, they get direct contact and, and um, it can be absorbed through the skin of their feet. And so just landing on a bush that's been, uh, you know, been peppered with uh, or sprinkled with, with some sort of toxic chemical, it gets right absorbed um, into their feet. Um, also, if they brush against it and, you know, birds do something called preening, which is giving themselves a, a, a bath the way cats do. They lick themselves and they, 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 they take their feathers and they, they use their beaks to clean their feathers off. So if you get any poison on their feathers, then when they preen themselves, they're ingesting the poison. Um, they eat it. I mean, if you've sprayed a rose bush and now you've got rose hips and then they eat the rose hip, um, they're going to get directly poisoned by eating it. Um, and it also tends to get into the water. So, um, yes, uh, being able to reduce the use of toxic chemicals is really, really good. Oh, and also, of course, I should say that toxic chemicals, especially if you're doing them as insecticides to kill off insects, is, is, is killing off their food supply. So it's not good for them. And again, I want to emphasize that about three quarters of our birds here largely live on insects in the spring. Uh, so we do want to have some insects around. And when I talk about toxic chemicals, I'm mostly talking about insecticides and herbicides, but also uh, rat poison, fungicides, um, really anything that you wouldn't want to eat, um, you know, uh, that's designed to kill something is, is, is not good for birds. Now, what if you need to use them? What if you just say, I'm sorry, I, I've just got to got to get rid of the weeds in my yard. I got to do something and I don't want to pull them. Um, what can you do? What can you do? Well, if you're going to use a pesticide or an herbicide, use a targeted specific one rather than a generalist. I mean, you can, you know, if your problem is this type of beetle, you can find a chemical that's really specifically, it kills this type of beetle as opposed to anything and everything. So always go for the most targeted specific chemicals. An alternative that's better is to plant plants that repel insects. There are some plants that insects don't like the smell of, and if you plant them, um, that'll at least keep the numbers down. Um, and similarly, um, there are some plants that attract predatory insects, insects that eat other bugs. And so if you can attract those insects to your yard, those predatory insects will, will I mean, the famous example, of course, is that the, the, the ladybirds, um, ladybird beetles um, eat aphids. So if you've got aphids on your rose bushes uh, and you get uh, uh, ladybugs, they'll eat your aphids for you. So you can consider doing that. I mean, you can buy praying mantis eggs and put them in your garden. And praying mantises will take care of a wide variety um, Plants that, um, that are good to plant in this area would be, I mean, things that you would, would it's, it's not like they're exotic for around here. I mean, dug firs um, attract predatory insects. Madronas do, elderberries do, snowberry does, uh, Mr. Roses do. And then if you've got a vegetable garden, um, you know, plant some marigold or some parsley or for some dill or some rosemary. All of those either tend to repel insects or to attract predatory insects, and so are very good things to do. And again, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but another thing you can try to do if you if you want to get rid of bugs in your garden is attract birds, because the birds will eat the bugs for you. Um, so it all goes hand in hand. Kim, I'm gonna, um, when you step to your right, we have a hard time hearing you sometimes. Oh, oh thank you for letting me know. I will now not step to my right. Okay, thanks. Okay, that's because my notes are on my right. That's why I've been leaning that way. Um, okay, so those are the three things you want to help birds avoid. Let's talk about the things you want to give birds and make sure they have. And so you want to give them shelter. And there are lots of different ways to give birds shelter. 
Um, you can put up a birdhouse and we can talk about that. You can leave up snags. You can have um, litter piles and, and you can leave leaves on the ground. All of those are good, good ways to provide shelter for birds and I wanna go through them all. So let's start with birdhouses, okay? I have a particular pet peeve about birdhouses because a lot of people put birdhouses up, a lot of stores sell birdhouses and the, the main criterion seems to be that they're cute and pretty. Um, most birdhouses that I see are actually harmful to birds. If you're gonna put up a birdhouse, which you certainly don't have to do, there are lots of other ways to give them shelter. Um, but if you're gonna do it, you gotta do it well. Um, again, you know, if you go into to, to a store, if they're just selling something that looks nice, it, it really may not be something that, that's gonna help a bird at all. So here are some of the necessary features um, <clears throat> of a good birdhouse. Um, first off, it has to be the right fit. And there are tons and tons of web pages. And again, I'm happy to give you any of these um, if you contact me <clears throat> about the right fit um, for each species of bird. Birds are very particular. Um, so if you want to attract a song sparrow, you have to build a different kind of house than if you want to attract a wren. Excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of water here. Okay, when I say the right fit, I mean the overall dimensions and importantly, the size of the entry hole. The, 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 the rule of thumb is you want the smallest hole possible for your species of bird to get through. And that's to keep larger birds from displacing them and predators, other types of predators from getting in. So you always go for the smallest hole possible. Other things about birdhouses um, is you want them to have ventilation holes. In the summer, especially, birdhouses can get very, very, very warm. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to have ventilation holes. And if you've got a birdhouse that doesn't have them, you can make them yourself. Just get a drill, put a drill bit in it. And right under the roof, high up on the walls of the birdhouse, just make some holes. Just go around and make some holes. And that'll let air pass through, which not only will help keep the temperature down in there, but also um, will help it dry out. It will keep it from getting excessively moist, which promotes bacterial growth. Um, so get some ventilation holes in there. Similarly, drainage holes. Do the same thing. Take your drill and just poke a few holes in the floor of your birdhouse. Again, you know, when think about Think about cracking a chicken egg. Um, well, that's not really a very good analogy. When, 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 birds, when birds are living in a birdhouse, they're pooping in there. When the eggs hatch, there's a lot of liquid still left in the egg. It gets really wet in there with the kind of substances that attract bacteria. So you wanna let them drain out, okay? So drainage holes. Um, Good bird birdhouses have overhanging roofs or even better entry tunnels, okay? You're trying to make it hard for a predator to stand on the roof of the birdhouse and stick its head in the opening because the hatchlings are just completely helpless. The eggs are completely helpless. So if you've got an overhanging roof, you're, you're lengthening the distance that the predator has to be able to lean over and not lose its balance to be able to stick itself inside the birdhouse. And that's why entry tunnels are even better. And if you don't have an entry tunnel on your birdhouse, again, it's very easy to, to get a hollow tube and just add one. Um, and then you can make sure that it's very small, the right size for the bird that you've got so larger things can't get in there. I mean, I've seen raccoons trying, you know, just sticking their hands into the entry hole um, of birdhouses. If you put an eight inch tube, the little bird can get in or a six inch tube, but now the, 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 the um, raccoon can't stick its paw all the way in and, uh, and, and do it, or a bird can't stick its beak in. So for the same reason, you do not want to have an exterior perch. If your birdhouse has one, cut it off. Very easy to do, same difference. We're trying to make it harder rather than easier for predators to sit there and stick themselves into the birdhouse. 
different kind of issue. Um, they need to have smooth entry holes. And I would recommend uh, if you've got a wooden birdhouse to take some very fine sandpaper and smooth around the entry hole. Again, we're talking about good birdhouses have tight entry holes with a tight snug fit. And so it can snag the bird's feathers. And so smooth it out so you're not yanking out feathers when they go in and out of birdhouses. <clears throat> no doubt, the best material for a birdhouse is wood. I would definitely go for an untreated, unpainted on the inside wood birdhouse. Um, better than plastic, certainly better than metal, um, better than ceramic. <clears throat> unpainted interior, because you don't want them eating paint chips. Um, this is for you more than for them, but it really helps if it has a hinged roof or a hinged floor. Birdhouses should be cleaned out at the end of every breeding season. You should clean out the old nest that's in there. Again, it's a gunky, it's breeding bacteria and disease. So get rid of it. Much easier if instead of having a two inch hole, you can just take the whole roof off. Um, so a hinged roof or floor. And finally, you need to position it well. Um, and there are different things and it differs by bird, by bird species. But um, birds again are very fussy. Um, so <clears throat> for different species, you want the birdhouse to be uh, different heights off the ground. You certainly want to make sure that, that there's a clear flyway, an adequate flyway in front of it. You don't want, you don't, you don't want them to go three feet and then there's a bush. Um, you want them to be able to take off and get off and land easily. You want it to be far enough away from your bird feeders that they're not frightened away by large birds coming to your bird feeders. So for example, my bird feeders attract stellar jays. If I put a bird feed, a bird house uh, 10 feet from there, nobody would use it because they'd be afraid of the stellar jays. So keep them far enough away. And I can't tell you what that distance is, but I would guess 20 feet at a minimum from, uh, you know, from your bird houses excuse me, your, your bird feeders. Um, so anyway, birdhouses are wonderful things. They can attract birds, they can be good for birds, but they also can be bad for birds. Oh, oh, another thing I should say, well positioned is not in the sun, not in the sun. Um, just make sure it's in shade rather than in a sunny spot. That's easy to do and really helps keep the temperature down. So birdhouses, that's one way to provide shelter. An even better way to provide shelter is to leave up snags. Hold on, I'm taking another sip of water. <clears throat> okay, snag is just a fancy name for a dead tree that you've left standing. Okay, and what you can do, because you don't want it to fall over and hit your house, is instead of having an arborist come and take the whole tree down if it dies, is let him leave as much as he can and then take off the top 20 feet or the top 40 feet or whatever you need so that um, your snag, even if it were to fall over, wouldn't hit anything. Um, snags are widely, widely used. I mean, they're just a quarter of all Pacific Northwest birds use snags if they're available. So this is a great way to attract birds. They use them because, well, it's a food larder because insects love dead trees and insects love dead trees because the wood gets soft as it starts rotting and it's easier for the insects to burrow in or to eat the wood or whatever it is they're doing in there. But in any case, snags attract bugs and it attract insect eggs. A lot of insects like to lay their eggs in snags under the loose bark as the bark gets looser and looser. And so birds will, will forage there and eat, uh, eat the insects cavity nesting birds, you can see this pileated woodpecker here, um, cavity nesting birds um, will build their nests there. Um, some birds will, will store food, um, they'll, they'll, they'll uh, store food in holds, um, in snags, and some birds use them for drumming to advertise their territory. However you look at it, um, snags are widely used, have multiple use, uses, and they're shared. You'll find lots of different species. Um, I can tell you that I have two snags outside my house um, and they're now about four years old or so. For the first two years, they didn't do anything. I mean, they just sat there. 
but after after the second year they had rotted enough on the inside or got the wood had gotten soft enough that now I think they're just about the most productive trees on my property for birds. Um, I mean, it's just wonderful. Um, they're, they're birds on the snags all the time. So leave up snags when you can. Okay, then there's brush piles, okay? Now, some people uh, raise their eyebrows when I talk about brush piles because brush piles I mean, they are exactly what the name is. I mean, you just you just gather up sticks and just put them in a pile and leave them in your yard. Um, the best way to do it, I should say, is the same way you'd build a campfire. You start with big pieces of wood and you go smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and you basically build it loosely so that there's a lot of cavities inside. And so they're not the most attractive thing in the world. They're certainly not the most tidy thing in the world, but um, if you've got a corner of your property in the backyard somewhere, a back corner where they're not going to be particularly visible, or if you've got a little patch of woods, they are terrific to attract birds and lots of different species. Um, it gives them shelter. They attract insects. Um, they also tend to collect water. So in the summer, that's nice because that's, a, that's a, a way to collect water for the birds. You've got some birds that stay on the outside of the pile. Some birds will go on the inside of the pile. Um, but, but a brush pile is a terrific thing, especially if you don't have bushes. I think it's less important to have brush piles if you've got bushes, especially um, open limbed bushes um, can take their place. But if you don't, this is a good substitute. You can also uh, give them shelter, um, also provide food and water, by the way, by just having leaf piles, leaf litter. Uh, and this is nice because it means that uh, you don't have to throw your dead leaves away. So, you know, in the fall, if you're the kind of person who, um, who rakes up their leaves, some people do, some people don't, just leave a pile of them. Um, tracks insects during the winter for sure, uh, and it's a food source for birds, and the birds also use them for hiding. Um, Oh, in, in case I forget to say it later, let me say this now. When people ask, again, I, I field questions about these sorts of things all the time. And a real common question I get is, I have done everything you said. I have put out food, I have put out water, you know, yada, 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 but I'm still not getting any birds or I'm not getting very many birds. Why not? The most common answer is, is you're not providing shelter. Birds are very, very skittish. They're afraid, they're nervous, twitchy little things. And having places where they know they can duck and hide really encourages them to come. Um, and so it may not seem like a big deal, but having a brush pile um, makes a huge difference because a bird is willing to come to your yard because they can see that if they need to get away from a predator, they can. So that, this is a really common reason people don't get birds in their yard is there's no place for the birds to hide. So anything you can do uh, will help. Now, again, another really good way to do this is by having bushes, especially loose open limbed bushes. For example, our native rodents are about as perfect as you can get when it comes to this, okay? Um, birds, I told you, I have 52 species of birds in my yard. When I sit and look out my kitchen window, I usually see 15 to 20 birds at any given moment. The reason for this is because my yard is filled with, with roadies um, and other bushes. And I put my bird feeders right in amongst them. Okay, so between two roadie bushes, that's where I put a bird feeder. And the birds are so comfortable because they can get away. You know, whatever scares them, they just disappear. Um, so shelter is, is really key if, if you want to, to attract birds to your yard. Okay, <clears throat> so give them shelter, give them water. Um, birds need to drink and bathe year round. Uh, you know, you'd be surprised. You'd think in the winter here, they wouldn't have any problem, but even in the winter, having a water source tends to attract birds. I'll, I'll show you a water source I provided um, in just a minute. 
in the summer, it is incredibly key to provide water. If I said, if there were two take home messages, if you're gonna remember exactly two things, I would remember one plant native plants. And the second one is, is provide water. And the reason for this is that when, when birds have hatchlings, when they, when they have nestlings, hatchlings, baby birds in their nest, they can make up to 200 trips a day carrying water to their babies. Okay, and the only way they can carry water is they fly to a water source, they, they've got very little bills generally, they fill their, their beaks with water, and then they fly back to the nest. They have to do that 200 times a day in warm weather. So it makes a big difference to them if there's water right near them, or if they have to go a couple of blocks to find it. So plant native plants and provide a water source or several water sources, and that will really help attract birds. Um, let's see. So what makes a good bird bath? Because that's how most people do it. Most people do it with bird baths. Um, and just like with houses, there are better ones and worse ones. So what makes a good bird bath? Um, most birds only like to go in to the middle of their thighs. Okay, <laughs> what would be their thighs? And so um, um, a bird bath with, with the, with, with, which has got a sloping bottom that gently goes from shallow to deep will appeal to the most birds. Bird baths, on the other hand, that just have an edge and a steep drop off, they can stand on the edge and use it to drink, but they can't, they can't bathe nearly as well. So I'd go for one with gently sloping sides rather than, than, than a steep drop off. I would go for one with a rough surface. Concrete is a really good thing. Ceramic, glazed ceramic is terrible because the birds slip and slide and they don't like that. They need to be able to get purchase. So a rough texture is much better than a smooth texture. Similarly, metal doesn't usually work uh, for that reason. By the way, if your water source, if your bird bath does not have gently sloping slides, then put in a ramp. Okay, just, just put in a wedge of wood, you know, or some sort of ramp so that they can walk in as deep as they want to be. In general, the water that's going to be used the most is between one and three inches deep. For most yard birds, that'll probably be good. Um, the other reason to avoid metal, by the way, is, 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 is in the sun, they can get quite hot. Um, now, if you are going to use bird baths, remember to keep them off the ground, to keep them away from cats, but also, although I love the look of them on the ground, it's not good because of cats, they also need to be cleaned because they do become breeding grounds for bacteria because the birds will poop in them, okay, and they're cleaning themselves. And so every week or so, you need to put in a solution that's nine par parts water with one part bleach, chlorine bleach. Let it sit for 15 minutes and then rinse it out, okay? It's a commitment to have a bird bath. You need to keep it clean, okay, please keep it clean. There are other ways to provide water. I will show you in a minute how to do that. Now we come to the last one, which is give them food, which is I think what most people think of first. Um, let's talk about giving birds food. Uh, depending upon the species, there's four different things that birds tend to eat. They tend to eat bugs. I can't see my own slide, so I don't know what that is. So I can't tell you what that is, but they need to eat. Um, they eat seeds and nuts, they eat berries, um, and then some birds have nectar. So there's different kinds of food that, that can be provided. And a really good way to provide them with food is to plant native plants. So I wanna start by talking about that as a way of doing that. Some people immediately think bird feeders, but planting native plants is actually better. So how do you, how do you, my cat running around. Um, how can you plant natives? Well, first off, you have to make room for them, okay? And to make, I gotta, excuse me, I gotta get my cat. Yowling. Um, she's very affectionate and needy. Um, okay, so native plants make room for them. Um, one way to make room for them, and, and this is good to do for all sorts of reasons, is get rid of any invasives you have. I mean, there are all sorts of plants that people plant or have just sort of gotten here by themselves, plant on purpose or have gotten here by themselves, that choke out native plants that tend to take over because they don't have 
uh, natural predators here. I'm thinking things like English ivy, um, Scott's broom, hogweed, uh, Himalayan blackberry, whatever, get rid of them, replace them with natives because they'll only keep spreading. Um, another thing you can do is to reduce the size of your lawn. And I wanted to talk about that. Lawns are basically deserts when it comes to providing food uh, or useful substances for birds and other animals. There are some birds that you see on your lawn, but far fewer than if you had almost anything else down instead of lawn. Um, and no, 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 down. Um, um, and now you want out. One way or the other, you gotta do something. Um, okay, reducing the size of the lawn. All right, you could plant native ground cover instead. You can increase the amount of shrubs and bushes that you have, more flower beds, whatever. But here's how I did it this, this past year. This was one of my, um, my quarantine projects. This is my front yard, uh, a little sliver of my front yard. And I can show you two ways that I got rid of my lawn. One is, is right here, this is the edge of a pond my husband and I dug. This is just the tip of it. So the pond is about 15 feet by about eight feet at its widest. Um, and we filled it, mostly filled with native plants. We now not only, and this is true all winter too, um, birds are in there all the time. We also have frogs. We've got three frogs that live in there. Um, our garter snake population has gone up. We have no problem whatsoever with, with, with mosquitoes or flying insects. In fact, a bummer for us is we wanted to attract dragonflies and the dragonflies come by and then they leave in five minutes because there's nothing for them to eat. So we, we don't have like a resident population of dragonflies because we put um, goldfish in there. There are a few goldfish and they eat mosquito larvae. So it, you know there's no problem that way, but it's a constant food source for the birds. Um, we've got platforms in there so that, that the birds can land and, um, which is just rock, fancy name for rocks, um, and, you know, be in very shallow water. Um, but that's one way to get, a, I mean, the reason we did this is our front lawn, you can see my little vegetable garden in the front, because it's the only place in my yard that has sun. So, because we're heavily wooded. So I wanted to get rid of my lawn and I wanted to plant native plants. We're up to 92 species of native plants in my garden. Yes, you can do this. Um, but in our area, there aren't that many native plants that like full sun because this isn't a full sun area. And I thought to myself, well, where do you see plants in full sun? And the answer is wetlands. And so I said, well, let's put in a pond. So we put in a pond. The other thing we did is here. And this may look like an unmowed lawn to you. This is all wildflowers here. I've got a line of wildflowers it goes around my yard. Um, but this may look like an unmowed lawn to you, but it's not. It's clover. Um, I planted clover and I wanna go back again to show you how pretty clover can look. Um, if you have a yard that's just, I mean, there's no grass there at all, it's all clover. And what I did, here's a closer view of it. This one is not native. I did not use native clover. And the reason I didn't use native clover is I didn't wanna mow. You can mow clover, but I didn't want to. Um, and native clover tends to grow too tall to not mow in my opinion you know, six to eight inches is too tall. This is a varietal of clover. Um, it's a white clover, so it has white flowers. So in the summer, my, my uh, yard is covered with white flowers um, that the bees love. Boy, does that attract bees. But uh, it doesn't grow more than three to four inches tall, so you never have to mow it. Um, it also, once it's established, doesn't need ever to be water. Clover, clover really tolerates drought very, very, very well. Um, so I thought this was a real winning thing to do. I'm going to expand the amount of yard. We've, this was like my experimental patch. So it's only about 30 feet by 10 feet, but we're gonna put it in my entire yard um, this spring. Uh, so I really, I mean, there's a way to reduce lawn. Oh, and, and is this better for, for birds and other wildlife? Yes, I mean, not only, as I just said, it's covered with clover flowers and my yard is filled with bees. I have not gotten stung. Um, they, you know, they're just happily doing their thing. Um, I can't say it, it's particularly better for the birds, but it's also um, garter snakes really like it because they can, they hide in there in a way they can't hide um, 
in grass. So, so that's another thing you may want to consider. But certainly getting rid of lawn, however you do it, um, is going to be good for wildlife. And so there's just the two ways I have been working on it myself. Okay. Again, plant planting natives to help birds. Think vertically. Um, one way to increase the variety and number of birds that you see in your yard is to have plants that are at different levels because birds tend to like to stay a certain distance off the ground. Um, and so for example, um, the very high, if you have, you can't just get a high tree, but if you've got a high tree, you know, that attracts swallows, it attracts pine siskins, um, you know, that you're not going to see if you don't have some pretty tall trees. At the middle level, you tend to get things like kinglets and chickadees and nuthatches. Definitely in the tree layer, but low to the ground, you get hummingbirds, you get goldfinches, you get bush tit. And then on the floor, the shrub level, level you're going to get thrushes and wrens and towhees and song sparrows and all different types of sparrows, like golden crown sparrows and white crown sparrows. So when you're thinking of planting, try to think about getting plants of different heights um, and you will increase the number and variety of birds that you see. Variety in general is a good thing. Um, I'm sure you don't like what's on the left because I don't think it's very attractive, but some people just put up these hedges um, and, and that doesn't do, just like a lawn, it doesn't do very much for birds because it, it's too dense for birds to get in. It, 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 it's one variety. You're much better off with a hedgerow sort of situation where you've got lots and lots of different types of shrubs with some spaces between them. If you put bird feeders in here, believe me, the birds would come. The bird, this is exactly the kind of shelter that, 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 that make, make birds come. When you're planting your natives, um, think about time because birds need to eat all year round. So you need some, some plants that are going to provide food in the spring, some that are going to provide food in the summer, some that are going to provide food in the fall, and some that are going to provide food in the winter. And depending upon the part of the plant that the birds eat, and when that part of all you know comes out, like berries can come out at different types of year, you can make sure that you have uh, food all year round for birds. So that that's something to think about when you're thinking about what type of plants to do. Another thing you can do. Some of my neighbors don't like this about my garden. Uh, is I don't deadhead um, because when you've got a dead flower, it's it's for some period of time filled with seeds, and the birds love to come uh, and eat the seeds. So delay deadheading. Um, you know, you probably eventually want to take them down, but 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 leave them for a while. Uh, that's another thing you can do. I plant sunflowers and leave them up till all the seeds are gone. And lastly, um, when you talk about feeding birds, um, we think about bird feeders. And before I do my usual spiel about bird feeders, I have to tell you that if you don't put bird feed, if you if you don't now put out bird feeders, this is not the right time to start. If you do normally put out bird feeders, you want to be really careful and monitor them right now. Um, we have we are in the middle of uh, a bird salmonella epidemic at the moment. Um, the reason for this is that. Pine siskins, I don't know if you know what a pine siskin looks like. It's, it's like a little tiny, smaller than a sparrow, but with a looks kind of like a sparrow with a very pointy bill and yellow on it. Um, normally come down, we normally get some of them in the winter, but Northern Canada where most, most of them stay in the winter had a very bad year in terms of the conifers uh, producing seeds between drought and climate change and forest fires, they don't have enough food. So they've come down south to the U.S. in unbelievably huge numbers. Um, and if you've been seeing large flocks of little brown birds, because um, they tend to be in very large flocks, you, you likely have pine siskins. In any case, they have uh, contracted salmonella. Salmonella kills birds. And so people are reporting all the time seeing dead birds all over the place. Because there is a salmonella outbreak, this is not, for most people, the right time to feed birds except for hummingbird solution. That's a whole separate category. Um, the reason why is that salmonella is passed by both saliva and feces. And if you put bird feeders out, um, you know, a bird might 
in trying to get a particular seed lick a different seed on the way over. Now another bird comes and eats that seed and gets salmonella. So at this time, the, the, the uh, official advice, in fact, the Washington uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife just came out with this recommendation, but it's what we've all been saying for a while, is either take your seed feeders down or be sure you clean them, they're saying daily. Um, what I've been telling people is you need to clean them at least once a week and you need to keep your eye on them. And the second you see an ill bird, because they're in some neighborhoods and not others, take them down. So this is not the right time to start feeding. But it's like the COVID crisis. I mean, th this is a specific epidemic. It will pass and then we can go back to feeding again. Um, just like we all hope to resume our normal lifestyle, you know, once COVID is, is passed. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't ever feed, but this is probably not the time for most of you to feed. If you do feed, you have got to keep your feeders scrupulously clean and take them down if you see any ill birds in your yard. What does an, a bird with salmonella look like? It doesn't want to fly away. Everything else flies away and it just sits there. It moves very slowly. Sometimes they look bloated. Okay, they look swollen and their eyes often are crusty and swollen. So if you see anything that looks ill, get rid of your seed feeders. But again, that's uh, that's not normally true. It just happens to be true at the moment. Okay, what do I get asked about feeders all the time? Well, first off, I want I use this picture on purpose to show you that you can make very inexpensive bird feeders. I mean, a bird feeder can be as simple as an old pop bottle with wooden spoons stuck through it. So you don't have to spend a lot of money uh, on bird feeders. The reason to spend money on bird feeders, uh, if you want to and can afford it, um, is because you can make them more squirrel proof. Um, and there are squirrel proof feeders. Um, there are other ways besides buying an expensive one to make it relatively squirrel proof. You can use baffles, you can make sure they're not directly under trees, things like that. But, um, you know, depends on how much of a problem that is. By the way, I have never found a chipmunk proof bird feeder. Uh, unless you put them just on a pole in the middle of your yard, but but you can usually, uh, squirrels you can avoid because there's some bird feeders that are weight sensitive. So if something heavy enough lands on them, they sink and it shuts off the window where they get food. So squirrels can't get food. The problem is chipmunks aren't heavy enough to do that. So uh, that's why chipmunks actually tend to be a bigger problem. Anyway, there are all sorts of bird feeders. Um, in, in terms of what you're feeding, the main types are seed feeders, like this one here, suet feeders, okay, um, hummingbird solution feeders, nectar feeders, um, and then you can put mealybugs and things like that on uh, mealworms on, on platforms. So there are different types of bird feeders, but general truisms about them. Um, Okay, general truth. Well, when people ask me about bird feeders, the first question is, what kind of food should I be feeding birds? Um, and the second question is, I'm afraid of attracting rice, uh, rats, and other vermin. So let me kind of address those issues in particular. Um, in more urban areas, and even really out in the country, um, some people are very worried about attracting rats. And again, that's a bigger or lesser problem depending upon where you live. How do you avoid attracting vermin? And the answer is, is you keep the feed inaccessible to those vermin. And basically what that means is, is you keep the food off the ground. Okay, you keep the food off the ground. There are lots of different ways to, to help that happen. A very easy way is to get this sort of tray so that when the birds kick out excess seed, it lands in the tray. You can then in the evening empty that tray and there's no available food for a rat or a raccoon or a possum um, at night, which is when they tend to come to feed. Another thing you should do to minimize spillage, because it's the spillage that really matters, is do not buy this type of feed, okay? This is mixed feed where you've got millet and you've got corn and you've got sunflower seeds all mixed up together. Nobody I know who's a serious birder does that, okay? This is not a good idea. 
what you want to do is you want to figure out what kind of food you want because different species of birds prefer different food, though many will take many different types of food. But you have different feeders that each has one type of food. So you have a thistle feeder, and that's all that's in it. You've got a millet feeder. That's all that's in it. You've got a sunflower seed feeder. That's all that's in it. Why is that better? The reason it's better is that the initial cost of the food is more expensive, but you don't waste any. And one, it turns out to be cheaper, but two, um, if I were a bird and I landed on this feeder, the honest truth is, is I'd stick my, my, my beak in and I'd pick up a piece of millet, go, oh my God, it's millet, and I'd throw it onto the ground. Most birds don't like millet. Pigeons and doves do, but very few other birds really prefer millet. So every time they, they get some millet, they just throw it away. Um, that not only wastes food, though you can get some ground feeders that'll pick up some of it, um, but it also contributes to this kind of spillage that attracts vermin. So again, I would, I would if I want to feed it, and I do, um, I, I have about eight bird feeders in my yard, make sure that each one only has one type of food. It will attract the birds that eat that type of food and you'll get a lot less waste. By the way, the reason some bird uh, mixes are cheaper than others is largely determined by how much millet that they have. And um, millet is largely wasted. Okay, millet is largely wasted, not entirely, but but largely. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say about this? Okay, so get good seed, uh, do it singly, get a tray. Ah, uh, another thing you can do if you're worried about vermin is to feed birds very little early in the day so that your feeder is empty at night. Okay, this is also good because we're talking about how the fact that you shouldn't let food just sit in there and, it, you know, that, 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 that's a breeding ground for disease. If you only put two inches or three inches of, of, of seed in early in the day, it would all be gone by night. You won't have a predator problem and you won't have, um, you know, it, it, won't, it won't be breeding bacteria um, sitting there. Another thing you can do is you can go uh, not use seeds proper. Um, you can either you feed hummingbirds. Um, by the way, don't waste your money on hummingbird solution. Um, you're paying for food coloring. Uh, the only solution hummingbirds need is um, a one to four ratio of table sugar and water boiled for two minutes, uh, left to cool and then put in the feeder. Um, red coloring does not attract hummingbirds. If your feeder has some red on it, the extra red you get from the solution doesn't, doesn't help anymore. Um, it's not necessarily good for birds and it's way more expensive than making it yourself. So, so you know, if you wanna feed, feed hummers, which is great, I've got two hummingbird feeders, um, uh, fine, but make your, own, make your own solution and save yourself some money. But that's certainly not going to contribute to, uh, to vermin coming. Another thing you can do if you wanna put seed out there is to make it sticky. This, this is actually mealworms rather than seed. But this is, a, I like these kinds of feeders um, because spillage is the problem. So if what you've done is you've got, you can use peanut butter, you can melt suet, put some seeds in it. In a jar like this, the birds can get to it, but the rats basically can't. Um, so that's a good thing to do. And again, it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, what, sometimes when I go to like fairs and things and set up a table, um, I do this activity with children, which is, this is just an old toilet paper roll, um, which I've smeared peanut butter on, or this person smeared, smeared peanut butter on and then rolled in seeds. And if you do that, again, the seeds aren't gonna fall to the ground, uh, or very many of them won't. And um, you're feeding the birds, peanut butter is great for birds, uh, a lot of protein and fat in that. In the winter, birds need fat, in breeding season, they need fat. Um, inexpensive, fun thing to do and um, keeps your seed off the ground. So just a little bit about, about feeding birds. Um, other ideas into how to help, help birds and help wildlife. This is a little bit further afield, but I wanted to say it anyway. Um, and that is vote. <laughs> 
Um, if you care about the environment, if you care about wildlife, then vote for candidates who do too. Um, this is a really important thing to do. If you care about climate change, I mean, vote. Um, and that's probably the best thing you can do is, is, is get politicians in who will enact policies that are good for wildlife. You can also work to reduce your own carbon footprint, uh, which is going to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Uh, reduce food waste, use less gas, reuse things, um, recycle. Um, anything we can do to slow down the pace of climate change is, is all to the good of wildlife. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk to you all about was this. Um, the National Audubon Society has an initiative called Plants for Birds. And it's an incredible, wonderful resource uh, to know about. If you just you know, go into your search engine and type Audubon Plants for Birds, this will come up, okay? This will come up because again, they're, they're so, they're, there's such a strong knowledge and understanding that native plants are so useful for birds. What they're trying to do is encourage people to plant native plants. So anyway, if you go to this page, which you can then, whoops, get to, is their data, whoops, sorry, is their database. And if you, so you click on database, you get here. And if you put in your zip code, you don't have to give them your email address if you don't want, put in your zip code. And what comes up is by zip code, um, this page. <laughs> um, and you can refine your search. These are all plants that are good for birds. By what type of plant? Are you looking for a bush? Are you looking for a vine? Are you looking for an annual or a perennial? You know, that's what the drop down menu would show. Plant resource. Are you trying to get flowers for birds, berries for birds, um, you know, seeds for birds? What kind of resource? What kind of bird you want to attract? I really like wrens. Um, you can fill in none of those or all of those, and it will come up with a list of plants that it recommends for your zip code that meet the criteria that you set out for it. Um, and it gives you the best results first, which are the ones that are easiest to grow and most likely to survive. And it also gives you full results, which you know are gonna be a little bit iffier, should, should work, but are gonna be a little bit iffier. This is an incredible resource if you're trying to put plant native plants in your garden. It will tell you what should work. It'll tell you if you want a variety of things, like I'm really going for berries, this is what's going to work where you live. Um, and it's very, very easy to get to. Again, just, just type in Audubon Plants for Birds and you will get here. You don't need to know the exact address. Um, I don't know why I have the second slide. Anyway, um, I just want to close by saying that you are what hope looks like to a bird. Your actions really can make a difference. We're destroying habitat right and left. If you can recreate some good habitat in your yard, uh, it, it really, really matters. And you can do it. You can do it. Um, it it's not very hard. Uh, it's a few simple things like planting natives and making sure you've got a good water source. Um, and you can have a very birdy yard. And there's few things nicer than sitting with a cup of tea looking out your window and seeing dozens and dozens of birds at a time. And with that, I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Um, oh, I wanted to say in general, because we, we started, I started uh, uh, what we call an email hotline because so many people have gotten interested in birding or attracting birds during during this COVID crackdown. The, 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 the web address is questions for BHAS. This is one word, questions for BHAS, everything small except BHAS are all capitalized at gmail.com. Um, if you can either go to our main web page and you can find it there, or again, questions for BHAS uh, at gmail.com and we will answer any birding related question, uh, including about how, how to attract birds uh, in your yard to your yard if you go there. So anyway, I'm happy to try to answer a few questions. All right, thanks, Tim. Um, we have a number of questions in the chat box, and so I will help you go through those real quick. Um, going back to the, the spray for cats, um, yeah. can you spray that along the grassy areas to stop them from accessing your yard? You can try. I don't, th I've never found that it works 100%, but I found that it really does work, you know, 
80%. You no, know? I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll keep most cats out. There are a few cats that, that seem very determined and it won't, but yeah, sure. You can, you can put it anywhere. You can also use it on the couch if you don't want them on your couch. But um, I use that spray all the time uh, at the edge of my yard because I have a cat that I put in her yurt, but my neighbor has two cats that wander and it drives my cat crazy. I don't want them in my yard because of my bird feeders, but it also drives my cat crazy. So I put it along our, you know, the edge between their yard and my yard. And it, it's really cut down how much they come through. Um, for the details, are those on the inside of the window or the outside? Outside. Any suggestions? And you, you have to put them in the right direction. It says on the, on the sheet that they come on, it says this side, against window, <laughs> um, because what you want is not to see the ultraviolet, right? You, you want to see as little as possible. So only one side is ultraviolet and that goes, the whole thing goes on the outside of your window and the ultraviolet goes on the outside rather than against the pane glass. Um, in, in terms of decals again, um, are there any um, brands um, that you recommend or um, uh, spacing on the decals? Do they need to be a certain distance apart from each other? I have a pretty, I think my house has pretty standard sized windows. Um, and I would say, if you have a window, I'm looking at my window, if you have a window that's maybe four feet by three and a half feet or something, you know, a decent window, I would probably put two on that. On a, on a, on a sliding glass door, I have three. Um, Tim Nelson commented in regards to that question, um, birdsmartglass.org has window collision products and a bunch of good information there. Um, I was going to say, I, I, there are several brands out there. What I think matters most is this ultraviolet reflective coating, because, because most people don't want to see um, the decal very much. And the alternative is to have a decal that, that's just like, you know, bright colors or something like that, which is fine, but then you're looking at that when you look through your window as opposed to seeing very little. So. Uh, Judy mentioned that dish soap and water and the spray bottle works for aphids. Yes, it does. You know, oh, I should tell you this. Um, again, I, I used to live in New Zealand uh, for a few years and New Zealanders are crazy gardeners. I mean, they, they, they live for gardening. It's the national hobby and nobody there uses any uh, herbicides. What they do instead, and it's what I do now and it works really well, is they use boiling water. So if you've got weeds and you can get a steamer too. I mean, you can actually buy steamers, but I just take my coffee pot, you know, my, my, uh, my electric, you know, water heater pot, and I, I let the water boil, and I walk outside, and I, if I've got a stray dandelion, you just pour it on it, and boiling water, you know, it, it takes a few days, but the, the plant will die, and it's obviously completely harmless to do that. Uh, Cassandra mentioned that she released ladybuds last year, and uh, made a huge difference on her roses. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I shared a, a website link earlier in the chat, um, nestwatch.org has a lot of great information about birdhouses and how to space them and what height to put them at and mm -hmm. uh, dimensions mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. I'm actually there. a member of nestwatch.org, yes, they do. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I also mentioned uh, we have a recording on our website about dead trees and snags. And so I encourage you to look, uh, uh, watch that if you're interested in learning more about dead trees and snags. It's on our monthly programs page. Um, looks like you kind of talked about the salmonella out outbreak already. Um, uh, brush piles and rats. What are, what are your recommendations if you have rats? I think if I had rats, I might not do it. You know, you know rats are a problem you either have or you don't have. Um, you know, we don't have a rat problem, so I've got brush piles, but if, if if I did have rats, then I probably would not have brush piles. I would plant roadies instead. Um, how often did you say to clean your bird bath? Was it okay. once a week? Um, you know, in normally in the winter, normally in the winter, I would say once every two weeks. In the summer, 
normally, I would say a week to 10 days. Now the official Washington state recommendation is daily. To be honest, I'm not sure I'm gonna do it quite daily, but I'll probably try to do it a couple of times a week. Um, and what's really important, I think, is that you keep your eye on them. I mean, birds that have salmonella look sick. I mean, you're, you're not gonna mistake it. And, and there are people, I mean, I, I spoke to a woman a couple of days ago who had eight dead birds in her yard. This is a woman who should not be feeding birds. I mean, that right now, yeah, you know. I, on the other hand, who normally have 15 to 20 birds in my yard at any given moment, have not seen a single ill bird. So, you know, but I look, I look dozens of times a day, you know, I write out my kitchen sink. Um, and if I saw a sick bird, I, I, would, I would take my bird feeders down. Um, but I think right now I would do it. They, the official recommendation is, is daily. I think you'd probably get away with every other day as long as you keep your eye out for sick birds. Um, do you know for clover, does it grow well in acidic soil? Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I don't. I, I, I don't know. Um, I think the answer is probably yes, because I have rather acidic soil and it's doing fabulously. Uh, it, how, how tolerant is the clover for walking over it or dogs running over it? Um, well, this, t this particular one that I grew uh, tops off at three to four inches. And I found that you have to baby it when it's being established. It also needs a fair amount of sun. You're not gonna do this in deep shade. Um, but once it's established, um, when you walk on it, you leave footprints and an hour later they're gone. And I don't have a dog, so I can't quite talk about dogs, but people, I walk on it all the time now. And again, unlike grass, I can see my footprints, but, th but they're gone in a little bit. Um, I was like, Megan recommended a couple of books, uh, Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Tallamy and Gardening with Native Plants in the Pacific Northwest by Kruckenberg. Yes, that's, that's the Bible. <laughs> um, uh, Laurel mentioned the Washington Native Plant Society is a really great resource. Um, I'm also on their Facebook group, and so they have a really great Facebook group as well, if, um, and people answer questions on there all the time. Um, see. And your photo of the hedgerow, it was, there's a slide with two photos, one of the hedgerows and one with hedge yeah. mm -hmm. plants. Um, um, do you know what plants were, were in the, the nice looking photo? No, sorry, don't. Just found a nice photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this was answered in the chat, um, but in case anyone didn't see it, um, are suet feeders safer? for the pine siskins, or should we take those down as well? I would say it depends upon whether you're attracting pine siskins. I find that my pine siskins love suet. I mean, so I, I have as many pine siskins on the suet. Um, in fact, so many that they're tumbling over each other at this this year. I mean, where, where you know, they're more than one bird thick. Uh, you know, I can have, I don't know, more than a dozen way more than a dozen pine siskins on the suet feeder. So again, I, I would be very cautious. Of, I've got mine up, but I'm very cautious about it. If I saw any ill birds, I would take it away in a second. But yeah, they go after suet. And then I shared a few links. Um, Audubon has a few PDFs about bird feeders and bird seed and bird feeding. And so I shared links to all those. Great. Um, if you Google those, you should find them as well pretty easily. Um, let's see. A lot of people saying thanks for the, the presentation, really enjoyed it. Um, let's see. Uh, Megan Smith made a good point. Um, local conservation districts are a really great resource for native plants. Um, that I know the Snohomish County Conservation District their plant sale is going on now, but my guess is they might be sold out because they sell out pretty early most years, I think. So um, if you're looking for plants, so that's a great resource for next year. And if you don't live in Snohomish County, I would check your local conservation district, um, King County or, or wherever you live. Um, what is the safest way to get rid of moss in the yard and is it safe for birds? 
or, or and and is safe for birds. Sorry, what's the best way to get rid of moss and and is safe for birds? I can't answer that because my answer is I'd leave the moss. <laughs> That's what wants to be there. <laughs> Usually. Most products that are designed to kill moss are not particularly good for birds. Um, but they're not good for pl other plants either. So I mean, the, the problem is, is that if you, I can't speak about every product, but, but many of them are designed that they'll kill the moss, but then, you know, it gets into the soil and the water and that it's not good for other plants. I mean, you know, if it kills moss, it'll kill other things too, if there's enough of it. But but my my really my gut level response is, is you've got that, you know, if you've got shade or whatever is, you know, like moss or put in ground cover. Um, in terms of cleaning or preventing salmonella around mm -hmm. the ground, um, do you have any suggestions on cleaning or clearing out the area beneath your feeders? Um, would be a, a really good idea. You can certainly sweep up. First of all, I mean, I, I, I would switch to feeders that are gonna have less spillage on the ground. And again, just putting a platform under your feeder, you know, will do that. Or even, um, for example, you might just take a plastic garbage bag, uh, put a slit in it so you can put it around the pole and so the food will fall onto the plastic garbage bag and then you can easily clean it up. Um, I mean, that's probably the best way to get up everything that's on the ground. Sometimes when people have rat problems in particular, that's what I suggest that they do so they can just make sure they get everything everything up. But a good idea if there's salmonella. I mean, part of the problem with salmonella that I didn't say, I mean, it is transmitted through saliva and feces. It's just simply the problem with a bird feeder is that there's so much food in one place that you do get multiple birds standing next to each other. Whereas with more natural food sources, the birds are more dispersed. So if you're gonna have multiple bird feeders up is keep them far apart from each other at least. So you're, you know, you're keeping the crowd size at any one place down. But yeah, I like the idea of doing, of either sweeping up or putting something under your feeder to just being able to throw out the food. And I would do that at the end of every day. Here's one that might be a challenge. Um, okay. Um, I have an orange ladybug looking insect. I understand they're not beneficial to plants and they bite instinctive hit. Oh yeah. You know what this is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a Japanese uh, ladybug. Um, and uh, they, they're they invasives from Asia. Uh, they're displacing our native lady, ladybugs. They don't look exactly the same. They look very close. They've got a different number of spots. Um, yes, they do bite. Um, it's not the most painful thing in the world, but yucko, uh, don't, don't tend to like those. Um, no, and they, 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 they're not really super harmful, except that they're displacing our native ladybugs, but they, they yeah, you don't want them. I, mean, I don't know what to say about them. They're not, they're not beneficial. They're not true ladybugs. A place where they like to breed um, is, is in window sills. Like if you, uh, they, they, they like tight, close places to breed. So for example, if you, if you take your window and, you know, like slide it up and then look, look at, at the wall, you know, the, the frame, you often find their eggs in there. So if you've got an, if you've got an infestation problem, I would check around my windows. For it. I don't know what else to say about them. You're you're right. They're they're just unfortunate bugs. I'm actually quite familiar with them because when I lived in New Zealand, we had quite an infestation there of them. So, do you have any recommendations for ground cover for shadier yards? Oh gosh, lots. Um, and 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 I mean, it depends on how if you really want to stick to natives or not, I would get on the plants for uh, Audubon plants for uh, bird site and, and see what they're saying for, for your zip code. Um, but there, there are definitely lots of them. And then if you, if you have trouble with some natives, though, though around here, finding natives for shade is not a huge problem. I actually planted a lot of wild ginger that's doing really well in deep shade. 
And Brenda says she now did so many mosquitoes in the summer, she can't sit outside at dusk. Uh, what kind of birds should she be trying to attract? Well, um, okay. Swallows would be lovely. Good way to get swallows into your yard is a water source. I mean, that, that, that would be one thing you can do because they're solely insect eaters, so they're not going to come to a feeder. Um, we've got four or five species of swallow that you potentially could, could, could have in your yard, depending upon where you live. Um, any bird in the spring, basically. Again, uh, when they're feeding young, the young need fat, so their birds are all eating insects. Um, and what would I do? I mean, some of the best birds for insects are the hardest to attract in that they don't come to feeders. I mean, like wrens. I mean, wrens live pretty much solely on insects, but there's little that you can do except to provide bushes, 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 you know, places for them to hide and a water source um, will help get you wrens. Um, but, but, but anything, I mean, from, 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 from chickadees to, to, to toeys are going to eat, be eating bugs. Um, I mean, I mean, boy, fly catchers, but because they only eat bugs, you're not really, there's not much you can do to attract a fly catcher. So I would do what I can, which is water and, and shelter and some food, uh, but I'd put food last is, is, is what you'd need to do. Um, Trying to think what else you could do for mosquitoes. Poor you, there aren't that many mosquitoes around here. That's one of the benefits of living here compared to other places I've lived. Um, yeah, just just try to attract birds. That's that's what you can do. <laughs> All right, I think I've gotten through most of the questions. Uh, if I missed that question you had, um, feel free to to put it back in the chat or um, unmute yourself and just ask it out loud if you'd like. Um, Histrina um, is asking if there are any details that can be put on the inside um, because they can't reach the outside of their windows. Oh, that's good. Yeah, there are. Um, I mean, there are. They're not going to be the ultraviolet ones, but certainly, you know, another thing if you if, if uh, is you don't have to get decals. An alternative to decals are strings I mean, you can get these, um, I'm trying to figure out how to, it's almost like a net, but they're very, very fine. Um, sometimes they're just horizontal or just vertical, or sometimes they're actually like a net with boxes um, that you can affix to the top and bottom of your window. Certainly you can do that on the inside. And although it's covering more of your window, each one is very, very tiny. So you don't tend to see it very much at all. That might be, something to consider. And again, there are lots of different companies that do that, that make those. Any last questions for Tim? Well, you may have done it, Tim, there. Oh, well, I hope Follow it was useful. There is. <laughs> I, I thank you for, for wanting to make your backyards more, more bird friendly or front yards more bird friendly. And, and, and um, I hope some of those suggestions will help you out. <laughs>